one last idea to talk about in the study on transformational geometry, and that's the idea of Euclidean inversions in circles. Uh, it is a very interesting idea. It's kind of out of place unless you put it in context of the Poincaré model for hyperbolic geometry, which we will toward the end of this session. Here's the basic idea with an inversion. You have some circle, center at zero, radius of length r. The inversion in that circle, it's an inversion centered at O of radius r, is defined in the following way. If you pick some other point p and it's not O, P prime is on ray OP such that the product of OP and OP prime is R squared. So the inversion centered at O of radius R of point P is P prime. Now, how do we find p prime? Well, that depends. If p is inside the circle, it goes without saying that p prime should be outside the circle. If p is in, and obviously if p is close to O, then p prime has to be far from O and, and vice versa. So what if p is inside the circle? Well, if P is inside the circle, where is P prime? P prime is somewhere out here. Drop the perpendicular. Drop the perpendicular through P. Uh, and let, let T and U be the place, the places where that perpendicular intersects the circle. You know there are going to be two such places. So we've got these radii, and we construct tangents to the circle at T and U. Tangents to the circle, P prime is the place where those tangents cross ray OP. I maintain that OP times OP prime is equal to r squared. That's the claim. OP times OP prime equals r squared. Now you can prove that. You can prove that. You can find two similar triangles. You can find two similar triangles which means we are obviously in a Euclidean geometry. We can't talk about similarity otherwise. You can find two similar triangles whose sides are in such a proportion that this must be true. And I will let you hammer out why that is true. That is something we probably ought to talk about when we gather in class. Similarly, Here's my circle, centered at, oh gosh, that's an awful circle. So sorry, folks at home. Centered at O, here's some point P outside the circle. Point P is outside the circle. How do we find P prime, which is almost certainly inside the circle? Well, we find M, where M is the midpoint of OP. And we let alpha be the circle with a center at M and radius MP. So OP is the diameter of this circle alpha. Okay, so the two intersection points are T and U. We connect them with a segment. It is the claim 
that P prime is that place where the segment TU intersects ray OP. Again, the claim is that, oh, I should probably have gone red and blue, red and blue. The claim is that OP times OP prime is R squared. OP times OP prime is R squared. And again, it should be possible to find two similar triangles whose sides are in proportion in such a way that that is true. And that is something that you should prove when we gather in class. Some other things you should know about inversions. If I have an inversion in a circle centered at O of radius R, and P and Q are points that are not collinear with O, so P and Q, I mean, I got a triangle. Then triangle OPQ is similar to triangle O Q prime P prime. And that's a very interesting thing to think about. Uh, let's make this a little more obvious. Let's make P really close to O and let's make Q fairly far away, but still inside the circle just for, for convenience sake. We can extend ray O P We can extend ray O Q. We know that Q prime is someplace here close to the circle. We know that P prime is some point out here. And the claim is that triangle O P Q is similar to triangle O Q prime P prime. And intuitively, I suppose that's obvious, but the reality here is that OP times OP prime is equal to R squared, but so is OQ times OQ prime. So we could bring that over, bring that over, and say that OP is to OQ prime as OQ is to OP prime, and that is essentially saying that triangle OPQ it, OPQ is similar to triangle OQ prime, P prime, just picking the points in order. Uh, it would appear to be that that is the case. Okay. Now we use that and a, and a variety of other things to prove some very interesting cases, some very interesting things. So, for example, if I have an inversion centered at O, radius R, and L is some line that does not contain O, so L is just a random line, the claim is that the inversion is a circle that contains O. Now we're going to be really, really careful. Uh, we're going to be, well, we're going to be somewhat careful. When we invert the line, we get a circle except for O. So what Venema says we do is we invert the line and some point out at infinity. And that inversion is a circle that contains O. And the reason it can do that is because O flip-flops with this point at infinity. And the reason that has to happen is because back in the definition, what if OP is zero? What if we're dealing with O? 
well, then there's no value that could be here to turn that product into R squared. So we we create this point at infinity and refer to it as the, we refer to the plane plus this infinity point as the inversive plane, and that allows us to, to mess with the language just enough to get what we need. Um, here, oh, so here's the idea. Drop your perpendicular. Point P is the place where that perpendicular hits L. P prime is some point outside the circle. So if P point if P prime is some point outside the circle, here's the claim. The claim is that the line, oh let's make it a blue line. The line L maps the line L map maps to a circle with diameter OP prime. And the way we do this is actually really, really easy. We pick some other point Q on the line. P and Q are not collinear with O. And so triangle OPQ has to be similar to triangle OQ prime P prime. Now, where is Q prime going to be? Well, if O Q prime P prime is going to be a right angle, as this is a right angle, then O Q prime P prime has to be an inscribed angle on a semicircle. O Q prime P prime is a right angle. And that's true no matter where Q is on the line. And so we get this circle with diameter O P prime. So oddly enough, if L is a line, its inversion is a circle. If L is a line and O is on the line, so let's see, that's color coding. So this is M, the inversion of M is a line. It, it is it is the line. Now that doesn't mean side note la that does not mean that all green points are fixed points. It just means that every point on the line maps to some other point that's also on the line. Every point on the line maps to some other point that's also on the line. And every point that is on the line is mapped to by some point that's on the line. Just, just saying that honestly. Okay. Uh, ooh, not yet. A couple more things. A couple of corollaries. Uh, oh, let's go back here. Because the inversion of the blue line is the red circle, the inversion of the red circle is the blue line. So if you are inverting a circle that contains O in the circle centered at O, you get a line, uh, which almost seems basic. Almost. If you have a circle and the circle does not contain O, then it's, oh, I should move this up. Then its image is a circle. The image of circle alpha 
is circle beta, where that's alpha and that's beta. Of course, vice versa works just fine. Okay. Okay. Um, one more thing, and then the result that we need. If I have a circle, if I have an inversion in a circle centered at O of radius R, and I have some other circle that is orthogonal to circle O, and by orthogonal, I mean right angle here, right angle here. If beta is orthogonal to O, then, well, no, it's not orthogonal to O. It's orthogonal to the circle centered at O of radius R. Then the inversion centered at O of radius R of beta is beta. And that is a very big deal. So, hey, coach, what's the deal with all the inversions? Why do we give a rip about inversions like this? Well, this is the hyperbolic plane. In the hyperbolic plane, you have two kinds of lines. You have the kind of line that runs as a diameter in the disk. And when you do transformations in the hyperbolic plane, the transformation runs exactly the way you think it does. I have point P, I reflect over this diameter, I get point P prime. No problem. But what happens if I have some other line in the hyperbolic plane? Well, any other line in the hyperbolic plane has a right angle here and a right angle there. It's a Euclidean circle. It's a Euclidean circle that is orthogonal to the Poincaré disk. When we reflect over these lines, we perform an inversion, an inversion centered at the center of this circle with radius equal to the radius of that circle. And so that's why Venema includes this whole section on inversions because he wants you to recognize what transformations are in the hyperbolic plane. Transformations in the hyperbolic plane are just Euclidean inversions in a circle. So that's a cute little piece of information that you should probably have. And that's that, That's all she wrote. That's, that's it. Okay, so I'll see you tomorrow.